In this lecture, I will be reviewing heating and cooling curves from the three uh, most prominent phases of matter. So we're going to deal with solids. Let's say we deal with water first, H2O solid to H2O liquid to H2O gas. Okay. Now, uh, solid liquids and gases. In fact, I have this thing called solids. Solids vibrate in their fixed positions. They have a crystalline structure. Okay, and that crystalline structure is a repeating geometric arrangement. Okay, for those that have studied crystals, face-centered cubic, body-centered cubic, any case, here's my 3D uh, arrangement, although I'm drawing it in two dimensions, of my crystalline structure, let's say, of ice, even though ice makes more hexagonal structure, you get the point. Now, in liquid phase, these molecules, okay, are more random and haphazard. They don't have any crystalline structure to them, okay, and they actually have more motion, obviously. They have more energy. In fact, the energy they have is so much greater than the solid. These solids who are stuck vibrating in their fixed positions can now overcome each other's attractive forces and move out of these positions. See, the reason why they stay in these fixed positions is because the attractive forces between the molecules are so strong that they're forced to stay there. But if you give the molecule enough energy, thus motion, to move out of those positions, they can melt. And that's why uh, liquids have greater energy than solids. Solids, liquids, and gases have tremendous energy where they're flying around uh, without very little types of attractive forces. Okay, if there's any attractive forces at all, we'll talk about that. So they travel upwards of hundreds of miles an hour, up until the speed of sound, we would say. And these molecules, having no attractive forces, can fly out of a container and not stay there, whereas, of course, liquids have greater energy than a solid. They're stuck in the container, okay, because they still have significant attractive forces. And, of course, the greatest attractive forces are in the crystalline structure. So, clearly, energy is needed to make this happen, okay? And we've talked about this being an endothermic process. What we're going to do is we're going to uh, look at the graph um, with time as a coordinate, and we're going to watch what happens, okay, in this graph when we measure a kinetic energy or temperature, the average kinetic energy, and this time. So let's do that. So I'm going to have here is a graph. Okay, I'm going to start with a y-axis, the best that I can draw. In this y-axis, okay, I'm going to have temperature, which we all know is to be the average kinetic energy. Or motion, energy. And on the x-axis, the best that I can draw, we're going to have a time coordinate. And in this time, we're going to say heat is being absorbed by the compound or consumed. I like the word consumed because the idea that heat's being absorbed makes you think that that block is going to get warmer. And I know we had those problems, but when an object or a physical thing like water, ice, solid, absorbs heat, it isn't necessarily just get warmer. It's using that energy to do something, in this case, become a liquid. So heat absorbed, but another good word is consumed. It's using the energy for something, not just taking it in. Okay. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to start with uh, ice below its freezing point. Now, its freezing point is 0 degrees Celsius, 273 Kelvin. 32 degrees Fahrenheit, but we're going to stay with the Celsius value, okay? And we're going to start with ice below its freezing point. You may say, well, how did that happen? Well, that's very possible. Take ice below its freezing point, and for instance, if you had ice at negative 20 degrees Celsius, so if I have ice in sub-zero weather, uh, it's going to be as cold as the air temperature eventually. You can have ice at zero degrees Kelvin. Uh, there's no limit to how cold it can get until you reach the, I guess, the limit, the zero Kelvin. So there is a limit. In any case, so I take ice, and I'm going to heat it. And this is measuring average kinetic energy, and of course, it's going to go up. It's going to go up until it reaches a special temperature, which is its freezing point. 
or melting point. And I want to make that very clear. In this case, all right, this is its melting point temperature. I'm not much sure if I drew this as accurately as I could have. I'm just going to lose the whole line here. But this is the melting point temperature. So my line is going to come up to hits that. Okay. Now, once it hits its melting point or freezing point, again, those are the same temperature. It depends on which way we're going. Since we're talking about a solid, okay, an ice below its freezing point, so we have a solid, okay, and it hits this particular temperature. Now, let's mark it. it. Hits the melting point. I didn't mark that very well. So it's melting point temperature. Okay. Now, that's a phase change. You say, well, that point is melting. Well, actually, it's the temperature. Okay, now, at this time, okay, what happens is energy being absorbed or consumed is not making the solid go up in energy. See, the reason why the solid went up is because it absorbed energy from its environment, let's say a warmer air temperature, and it made the molecules that were in a fixed position vibrate faster until they reached a certain motion where they started to break away from each other and that temperature of course it's this melting point temperature now interesting enough we're gonna add heat at a constant rate okay so at, during this time period we're adding temperature at a constant rate so you expect it to keep going up but what happens is this levels out and this represents a phase change because a solid is being converted to a liquid here so this is our phase change. And anytime you see a heating and cooling curve that's leveling off, you know that a phase change is occurring. Now why? Well, the reasoning is very simple. Energy that's being taken in or consumed is not being used to vibrate the molecules more. See, the solid was using the extra energy to vibrate more and more and more until it, be, it broke away from the crystal structure. Here, we're using the energy not to vibrate the molecules more. Remember, temperature is motion. It's being used to pull them away. So molecules that are in a crystalline structure, okay, temperature measures the vibrational motions, but once they have enough energy to pull away, okay, the energy being, well, once you reach the amount of energy it takes to pull these away, the temperature stays constant because the energy is being consumed and used for the phase change. So the solid is going into a liquid here and the energy being taken in doesn't stop here, it's constant. But it's being used to separate them into a liquid. Okay, now once it becomes all liquid, and let's go through this for a second here, this point is all solid. We gain more energy, they vibrate more and more until you reach this particular temperature that's unique. It's a physical intensive property where that solid uses the energy to change phase. And so it's using the energy up. The energy can't be used to make them vibrate faster. Therefore, the temperature remains constant at a phase change. Now, at this point, we're like 100% solid. Here it's 99% solid. Here it's 50% solid, 75% solid, I'm sorry, 100% uh, solid, 75% solid, 50% solid, 25% solid, and eventually zero. Okay, zero. What does that mean? It means at that point, okay, all of that solid has been converted to a liquid. And if that is true, we're going to see another spike in temperatures. And this is the liquid phase. Notice the pure phases have spikes in temperatures because they're not using the energy, or they're only using the energy to make them vibrate faster. So as you add more temp energy per time, remember this is energy absorbed at a constant rate. So as we add more energy, into the system. This could be a hot plate on top of, you know, a beaker on top of a hot plate. So as we add energy, once we the phase change is over, the liquid can use all the energy to, to guess what, move faster, faster, and faster, and the th thermometer picks up those increasingly higher vibrational energies. But just as before with the solid, the liquid is going to level out again. 
And at this point in time, party people, this point represents the point where the liquid reaches its boiling point. Now, it's not just because I wrote a point, it's actually a temperature. So the boiling point is the temperature which this leveling out occurs. And of course, for water, at standard conditions, it's 100 degrees Celsius. So the leveling out means the energy being absorbed, or I should say consumed, is being used to go from a liquid to a gas. And I scream gases because they have tremendous energy. Okay? And you notice it levels out. So we would say that the energy being cons uh, taken in is consumed to use a liquid. Now liquids okay, don't have the three-dimensional structure and definitely have more motion than a solid, but they still attract each other and they still are close to each other. A gas, this molecule has enough energy to pull away from the attractive forces that keep a liquid together. And gases typically don't have any um, uh, that many tra attractive forces. So at this point, we would say the liquid has completely turned into a gas, and you probably have guessed it, this goes all the way up. And there is truly no limit to how hot a gas can get. And that represents our basic heating curve. Okay, but you should know some important points. The leveling out periods are the, are the phase change temperatures. If we're going this way, which is called a heating curve, this is the melting point temperature. This leveling out period is the boiling point temperature. But if we've got a cooling curve coming down, this would be the condensation point. Okay, condensation and boiling are the same temperature. Some, this is also going to be the freezing point. They're the same temperature, they're just going the other way. So a gas to a liquid is condensation. And a liquid going back into a solid, if this was a cooling curve, when you started with a gas going back into a solid, this would be the freezing point. So these are synonymous for the same temperature. Okay, let's talk about a couple of different things. First and foremost, kinetic energy. All right, kinetic energy. Well, clearly, the, the graph... The kinetic energy is going up when you have a pure phase. Why? Because as you add energy to a pure phase, it's going to vibrate more. Pretty straightforward. Now, the flattening out off periods here, these very, very important particular parts of this graph, these are parts are where the phase changes occur, and they, of course, do not have any kinetic energy increases. And you need to know why. And one way to explain this, as I talked about, is the energy being taken in is consumed to separate, not to vibrate more. However, another fancy way to say, you would say that the kinetic energy, which is the temperature motion, is being converted to potential energy. Let me explain. Here the energy is being taken in to separate a solid from its crystal lattice to a liquid. And the kinetic motion energy that's being used is transferred to potential. See, a liquid has a lot more potential to move than a solid. Even though the temperature is staying constant, the only way to explain that we're adding energy at a constant rate, yet the temperature stays constant, is we're putting energy into the potential. See, there's two forms of energy. There's kinetic and there's potential. And both of them represent total energy, okay, as you would learn. And I'm not using the right designation for physics, but very simply, all of energy is either kinetic or potential. So if the kinetic energy is staying constant, even though we're adding energy to the system, we must be increasing the potential of the system. And we are because, my friends in chemistry, liquids have greater motion than solids. They have a greater potential to move around than a solid does. So as we convert a solid to a liquid, the potential energy increases. So we're converting the motion energy, okay, from let's say the hot plate to potential energy. Okay, here we're converting the liquid, okay, into a gas that's traveling so fast. And gases have more potential than a liquid. 
So my friends here, it's even the potential is even increasing even more. Notice this line is longer. This second line will always be longer because if we're, this is the energy being absorbed in a constant rate, it's going to take a lot more energy to make a liquid into a gas because there's a tremendous increase in potential energy. Gases are leaving the system, moving around hundreds of miles an hour. Okay, so the kinetic energy increases here, 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 remains constant here and here because of the what? Conversion of kinetic to potential. Now, you might think that that must mean that potential energy doesn't occur here, here, or here increases, and that would be wrong. Okay, if you're going to add energy to a system, the potential energy is always going to increase. So whether I have a phase change or not, on every segment of this line, the potential energy is increasing. All right. Now, in a cooling curve, the potential energy of every segment is decreasing, but decreasing the greatest at these levels. At a heating curve, the potential energy is increasing the most on these okay, uh, lines here, these phase change lines, and the least here. Think about it. If I add heat to anything, if I give energy to my little child, my three-year-old, if I give him too much candy, his potential for acting out increases. So even though I'm adding energy to a solid, you may say well, the potential energy can't be increasing, but if I give energy to anything, its potential to become a liquid increases. So any little energy given to this solid below its freezing point, it's going to get closer to becoming a liquid. Same thing here. As I add energy to a liquid, its potential to become a gas increases. And if you just give energy to a gas, its potential also increases. So anytime you add energy, potential energy has to increase. And if you go the other way, as energy is released in a cooling curve, going from a gas downward, energy, the potential energy decreases at every segment. All right, so those are the basics. Now let's go over some uh, major uh, understandings too. Obviously, we're climbing the energy ladder. Okay, so if we're going this way, up the ladder, clearly gases have a higher energy than liquids or solids. So this is an endothermic movement from a solid liquid to a gas. That's a very nice visual. Okay, and if you're going down from a high energy to low energy, you have to release the energy. This is exothermic. So I, I always tell my students, if you draw this out, gas is higher, liquids lower, solids low, you're going to get a nice visual to see that energy has to be released. You know, gas going to a liquid is exothermic. Condensation is exothermic. You ever see those fights scenes in movies where a guy's fighting in a factory and a guy pulls a hose that's full of steam and he puts it in the guy's face and he's hurting for a while? Well, steam is going to burn you potentially could burn a hole through you if it's hot enough because there's no limit to how hot a gas can get. Why does it burn? It gives its extra energy to your body and guess what? What you're left with is liquid water at the end. And liquid going to a solid, believe it or not, freezing is exothermic. When it snows out, which is really a gas going to a solid called depositioning, is also exothermic. When it starts snowing out, it gets a little bit warmer than places where it's not snowing. Okay, so something to think about. And also we have these positions on the graph. Let's uh, make some magenta areas. This is the place where, it f where the solid first begins to get heated. This is the position where the solid first begins to melt. This is where the solid has completely melted and now a complete liquid. This is the place um, uh, for the helpful hardware store. No, this is the place where, too much TV. Uh, this is the place where the liquid starts to boil, okay, convert into a gas, and this is where the liquid has completely turned into a uh, gas, and this is a gas being heated. So those are important points, and sometimes they'll ask you time frames between them. So from this point, so from the time period, let's make this four minutes, to the point where the solid first begins to melt, to the point where the uh, liquid just starts to boil, how much time is that? Well, this could be four, this could be let's say 12 and that would be eight minutes in between and very if I said that there was a hundred joules of energy per minute being absorbed and you knew there was eight minutes 
transpired between these two points, you would say that there was what? 800 joules of energy needed to go from this position to this position. Okay, not a very difficult topic. Um, hopefully you're looking at the um, demonstration that I have uh, posted above this where I time lapsed a um, uh, ice into water. It's taking for, well, forever to load, but that's what I want you to look at. And you can compare that and uh, hopefully you get something out of that. Okay, these are the basics of a heating and or cooling curve.